Art Blajos was born on November 2nd, 1950 and grew up in the Boyle Heights area of East Los Angeles. Like many young Chicano gang members, Art was raised on the neighborhood streets and by the state of California. It was in that dark world where Art acquired the nickname Conejo, Spanish for rabbit. His family and loved ones knew him as Art. The counselors and officers from the Youth Authority and Correctional Community referred to him as Blajos, inmate Blajos, or by his prison number. In the gang underworld, we dispensed with all formalities and simply referred to him as Conejo, his street name, from Primera Flats, his street neighborhood. As he navigated through his youth authority and early adult incarcerations, most of Conejo's years were spent behind bars. As a teenage offender and fellow rebel, I remember Conejo being released on YA parole and recall feeling happy to learn he had made it out to Broadway, as we nicknamed the outside world. Then the word quickly filtered back that he lasted only one day on the streets and was rearrested for a new beef. Now I didn't know whether I was supposed to feel proud of Conejo for getting popped so quickly or bad he didn't have a real opportunity to enjoy a longer period of freedom. Inside, outside, I suppose it didn't really matter to us in those days. Bottom line, the threat of incarceration was not a deterrent to people like Conejo. The rebellious spirit was like a disease to a seasoned gang member. You could pull out the violin and talk about how we were victims of poverty, police abuse, lack of a father figure, and many more favorite evaluations advanced on our behalf to justify our criminal lives and behavior. In the end, we were victims all right, victims of our horrible choices. Conejo stayed mad at the world in those days, but when he would return from the outside with a brand new felony charge, he received the red carpet treatment from his fellow gang associates. It was a case of misery loving company. We were all in the same boat and welcome aboard, carnal. Kindred spirits always had a way of finding each other. And in the latter part of 1966, Conejo and I were confined in the Adjustment Center in the Preston School of Industries, a youth authority facility in the Northern California city of Ione. I had manipulated myself into being housed in O Company, where I attacked an inmate on the weight pile with a barbell, nearly killing him. A few weeks later, Conejo was slammed in AC and housed directly below my second tier cell. He had been assigned to the farm company unit, which allowed inmates to work outside the institution in the fields. It also allowed them access to an assortment of farm tools such as picks, shovels, and mattocks. Conejo had a confrontation with a black inmate and proceeded to brutally attack him with a farm mattock, nearly killing him in the process. When you were housed in the adjustment center at Preston, no talking was permitted. The penalty for violating this rule was extra days in AC. So when Conejo was escorted in, we could care less about any rules. They must have added close to 60 days to our stay, but we didn't care. We kept on talking and talking loud. We even challenged them to give us more time. They did. Looking back, I can tell you for certain, we had some unresolved anger issues going on against someone or something in our lives. The most violent young men in jail directed their fury at some unfortunate target. It was often manifested against law enforcement and correctional officers anyone representing authority. 
It was also taken out against fellow inmates. And in our case, blacks were an easy target because most of them had the same rage festering in their lives too. Conejo hated law enforcement officers and black inmates with an unabated passion. Like all warehoused young men who were on the journey to becoming institutionalized and establishing a criminal career, our proving ground began in the California Youth Authority in facilities like Norwalk, Paso Robles, and Preston. The last stop was DVI, the Dual Vocational Institution in Tracy, which was also known back then as the Gladiator School. It housed a mixture of youth and adult offenders. The youth commitments had CYA numbers and the adult convicts had A and B numbers. DVI was the only facility where CYA wards were housed that had manned gun towers. Making it to DVI for us youngsters was like a badge of honor. We had made it to the big time, the last stop for a youth offender. December of 1966 would be my last Christmas in a CYA facility, and I received my Christmas package with a varied selection of goodies. One of my prison road dogs, Huerito from Florencia, per my instructions, shipped a care package using my family name and address. Inside the boxes of raisins were several narcotics pills, reds and rainbows they were called and I eagerly tore into the package and began the process of getting high as I awaited my transfer to DVI. I shared much of my illegal narcotics with Conejo, and he was in fact high as a kite on the day they came for me. I was transferred to DVI and Conejo would join me later in early 1967. Conejo definitely possessed the perfect resume to be considered for membership into the Mexican Mafia prison gang. But that would come a little later. Conejo did most of his time as a CYA commitment at DVI and predictably his number was called sometime in 1971. It was then he became a validated member of the Mexican Mafia prison gang. Having already joined myself in 1970 at San Quentin, I was there when word arrived of Conejo's induction into the clica. He was now a fellow carnal and his graduation would accelerate his criminal stature, elevating him to a higher level. The anger and rage Conejo savagely displayed was like a mirror image of his fellow M. Carnales who endeavored to be the worst they could be. There was the incident when Conejo physically overpowered a prison guard and held him hostage until certain demands were met. Then there was a 1975 event on the shelf, a unit below San Quentin's death row that housed prison gang members during a period when the war with the BGF was on. Mexican Mafia member Paul Memo Garcia had just returned from the visiting room and three BGF members who were exercising on the front section of the tier were ordered into their cells. The gun rail officer was supposed to confirm the closure of the cell doors and signal back to the control officer who then closed the bar over the cell doors. The African-American gunner guard gave the confirmation signal and Memo was allowed onto the tier where he would walk to his cell strapped and handcuffed and one of the guards would customarily uncuff him through his cell tray slot once he was secure inside his cell. Memo never made it to his cell. Instead he was intercepted by the three BGF inmates who were supposed to be locked in their cells. Out of nowhere they suddenly appeared each with a prison made shank and began to stab Memo. He alertly fell to the ground, kicking and spinning as his assailant stabbed at Memo's body, hitting him primarily in his legs and thighs. In the back section of the tier, several MM members 
were on their exercise period. A metal mesh screen effectively separating the two sections. Conejo suddenly grabbed the mesh from the bottom and with superhuman strength he began to somehow pull and lift the mesh upwards with an animal growl and look on his face that must have appeared like Satan himself. The BGF inmates retreated into their respective cells where they flushed their weapons. The control officer lowered the bar once again, this time securing them inside their cells. The prison security squad, also known to us as the Goon Squad, stampeded onto the tier, commanded Conejo and the others to retreat to their cells so they could transport Memo to the hospital. Memo suffered nothing more than some hurt feelings, a few holes in his legs, hip and thighs, and no serious wounds. Conejo, we teased him for a bit, referring to him as the Hulk, no doubt was responsible for saving Memo's life. Because of their ongoing engagement in violent prison activities, Mexican Mafia members spend the vast majority of their prison time in adjustment centers, isolation, segregation units, and long-term confinement. With hours of boring cell time to sustain, most of us read books. From Louis L'Amour shit kickers, Western paperbacks, to the Bible even, one of the favorite pastimes was sharpening up on Mexican and Aztec cultural history. Derived from the fascination with this literature, many Emek Carnales adopted a favorite handle, which effectively served as a new codename. Conejo was now referred to as Tochin. Now I'm sure there was probably some heavy meaning attached to everybody's Aztec nicknames, and they surely knew the origin and significance. On December 9, 1975, the internal Mexican Mafia execution stabbing of Cornelio Corny Carrasco took place at San Quentin's North Block housing unit. Inmate witnesses identified Conejo and William Willie Boy Bermudez as the attackers, but they were not willing to come forward as court witnesses. Corny had been recruited into Hashabi by Carlos Pieface Ortega, who later became an informant after dropping out of the M. Corny and other re new recruits brought in by Pieface were not accepted as members and Corny was told to remove his M tattoo. When he did not comply, Corny paid by surrendering his life. On November 24, 1978, Nicholas Nick Villa was shot to death inside his Northridge home. According to family members, they were led at gunpoint to a separate room by Conejo and fellow MM members Mike Bubu Moreno and Richard Baby Boy Resendez, where they were tied up, gagged, and admonished to remain silent. Nick was tied up in his bedroom, pistol whipped, and shot three times in the head. Conejo was charged with the Via homicide, was later convicted and sentenced. From the 1960s through 1980s, the LA Sheriff's Department made it a practice to stamp a purple star on the booking slip of anyone charged with a 187, a murder charge, so that their deputies would be aware of the more violent inmates in their custody. To us, it was like a badge of honor denoting the special status and the elite company we were a part of. Conejo and some of the Mexican Mafia members booked for murder in previous years are shown in this slide with the identifying star. While he was in the Los Angeles County Jail, Conejo's reign of terror on behalf of the Mexican Mafia continued. On October 2nd, 1979, Longtime MM member Gilbert Chaparro Ruiz was strangled, stabbed, and beaten to death in the LA County Jail by multiple MM assailants. According to inmate eyewitnesses who were there, Mexican Mafia members Chaparro Ruiz, Daniel Cuate Grajeda, Mike Bubu Moreno, and Aryan Brotherhood member John Youngster Stinson 
we're in the gang module unit squatting on the freeway, which is the walkway outside the jail cell and inside one of the cells. Youngster was actually Cuate Grajeda street crime partner and AB and MA were always considered compatible for classification and housing purposes. The men were all engaged in a sociable conversation. Chaparro and Youngster were facing from the inside of the cell, facing out to the freeway, as Conejo quietly walked up behind them from the back of the cell with a towel held in both hands. Youngster looked up and his eyes went wide, probably thinking he was the intended target. Conejo gave him a warning look to assure him he was good and proceeded to place it around Chaparro's neck. They had to conduct the jail count twice because they came up one body short the first time. On the second round, they got it right when they observed the dead body of Chaparro Ruiz on the freeway with blood draining from his throat, running into the water vent on the floor. Chaparro had paid with his life for violating an Eme rule. On still another occasion, Conejo's proficiency with a towel was put into practice while inside a penal facility and in the perfect position to take out another fellow member who had received the thumbs down for some M.A. rule infraction. Agustin Gus Rivera from San Diego was the target. Conejo caught him by surprise and twisted and turned the grip around his neck with the state-issued towel until Gus went out. After wringing his neck for several minutes, Conejo retired to his cell, pretending to be oblivious to what had just occurred. To everyone's shock, Gus regained consciousness and realized he was still alive. Conejo, as you can imagine, was beside himself with frustration at having failed. But such was the way of life in the mob. Years later, Sailor Boy and I teased Gus about coming back from the dead, but he was never in the mood to talk about it, even in fun. Poor guy. Without a question, and up to this point, I would classify Conejo as a one percenter in the world of evil men. If I sound like I'm glorifying who he was and what he did as a bad guy, this is definitely not where I'm coming from. The best part of the Conejo story is the contrast of who he was then and how his life transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Men like Conejo, considered by many to be irredeemable and hopeless cases, who suddenly forsake a life headed for death and destruction, do not just wake up one morning and proclaim it's time to put the brakes on things. Decades of programming does not suddenly cease without a reason. Like Kilroy, Big D, Johnny Green Eyes, and other hardcore dudes, Conejo's personal road to Damascus led him straight into the arms of his creator. It still sends chills down my spine just to talk about it because this is also what happened to me. Conejo wasn't in trouble with any of his carnales, nor was he looking to work off a long prison sentence, nor was he about to be rattled by a wife or girlfriend threatening to leave him. When Conejo got on his knees in his jail cell and surrendered himself to Jesus, this wasn't some calculated Mickey Mouse jailhouse conversion. His decision to become a born-again Christian not only altered his life forever, he is being used to this day in the lives of many young men and women. Conejo talks about being at a church fundraising car wash sometime back in the 1980s when a vehicle rolled up on him with people he thought were there to take him out. Instead, their parting words to him after confirming he was serious about his commitment to God, they uttered two simple words, be real. In other words, you serve Satan very well, 
You serve La M very well. So be real in what you're doing and don't come back. Then they drove off. What a blessing. 